Hello everyone, and welcome back to another Hearts of Ironford Dev Diary. Today, we're going to be going over the aptly named Giant Bag of Goodies, because my goodness, there is such a wide variety of topics to cover in this Dev Diary, I don't even know what to call this. We've got minor conflicts, we've got formable nations, we've got releasables, we've got Uruguay and Paraguay focus trees, Argentina, America, Canada, changes all across the board. With so much for us to dive into, we better get started on this dev diary. Let's jump in. So with so many topics inside this giant bag of goodies, the dev diary has been split up into separate devs talking about their individual contributions to separate sections of the project. We're going to be starting here with Jonathan. Now for anybody who's played in South America, they may have noticed that the Peru-Ecuador borders have always been kind of funky and there is a significant war in this region that seems to be missing out from the 1941 range. Well, it seems that in the next DLC, this has been alleviated, with the Peru-Ecuador conflict getting its own content. That's right, Oscar Benavides himself is actually getting content in the next DLC. I thought he'd been forgotten about, but it seems he may just yet have been saved. Surprise bitch, bet you didn't expect to see me. So in the next DLC, Ecuador is going to start with an ownership and a core on the state of Pastaza. Ecuador this is the one that Peru is now. going to claim and trying to take during the Peru-Ecuador conflict war. With this come a series of decisions that we can see here, move to secure Pastaza, nice. enforce our claims to Pastaza, and withdraw from the Amazon, which have the ability for Peru to obviously push their claim towards this state, you but also for Ecuador, if they play their cards right, to gain a state and white peace out, becoming an even stronger Ecuador. No shot. Also, if we take a quick look at the image for the decision move to secure Pastaza, we can see that both Ecuador and I think Peru both get add the Amazonian war as a national spirit, which gives them some buffs to attacking and defending on core territory, but also, and very importantly, can join factions no. So the core thing is here that they want this conflict to happen during World War II without it necessarily spiraling out and being a wider part of the Axis versus Allies conflict. One should also note that the decision does require either the United States to be at war or there be more than 35% world tension. So due to those requirements, there is an expectation that kind of World War II has already set off by the time you're eligible to take this decision. That being covered, I think it's going to be really cool to see some nice historical content going on in South America because the region right now seems very kind of static nothing really changes ever, um, which is very untrue to the period. There was stuff happening in South America, and now it's going to be just dynamically happening in the background, Peru and Ecuador engaging in that conflict. Good stuff. Next up, we have new formable nations, which is very much so a, a subject dear to my heart. One second, let's just read this. They aren't for the main countries getting focus trees in the DLC that are included in the patch, and for this part, I'm especially looking at you, Hovelax. Uh, I think I just got called out. <laughs> okay, I guess it's true. I have been covering formable nations for quite some time now. Goodness me, we've, we've gone through quite a few. So let's see what they've cooked up for us this time. First up is the Peru-Bolivia Confederation, which was a historical confederation that actually existed in the 1830s, so a nice 100 years before the time period of the game. This is accessible by either Peru or Bolivia, and effectively just requires one of them to own the other, so it shouldn't be too complicated. And there he is, that's our main guy. Long-awaited content indeed, a brand new formable nation. And it actually seems that even though it requires you to own just Peru and Bolivia, you actually get some additional cores, because that appears to be part of Chile, which has been called as well. Next up, we've got a very interesting formable nation, the United Guineas, so Suriname, Guyana, and Cayenne. And if you get the three of them united, you get this very interestingly coloured <laughs> formable nation with some additional cores in what I believe is Venezuela and a part of Brazil. I do appreciate that it's always good when countries that people necessarily wouldn't expect to be playing in the game, maybe it's their home countries in the real world, um, go to play as them and discover that they have content. Like, I'd love for somebody to be pl uh, playing the game in this region and be like, no, nah, the developers would have never put content in for my country. And then they look and there's this. 
and it, I don't know, I, it just always makes me feel a bit happy. And the last new Fumble Nation we can expect in the next DLC is the unification of Hispaniola. Quite simply, the island of Hispaniola can be united as it's got a big line going straight down the middle between Dominican Republic and Haiti, which either nation can decide to get rid of. And there we can see the power of Hispaniola. Um, only three factories, so you may want to get yourself a picture of Karl Marx to really bring in the manpower. Also, I didn't realise that the Democratic Party of Haiti is called Vincent. Um, sure, he, uh, he named it after himself. Fair enough. Speaking of interesting new content, next up we've got new releasable nations. And again, this is always where you find some really interesting ways to play the game, countries you might never expect to appear, um, really just shifting the way the game can play entirely. And sometimes, when you're very lucky, unique tech can appear. So first up, we have the nation of Quebec, uh, capital of course being Montreal. I think the French Canadians would appreciate something like this. I'm also very interested to know if they will have retroactively changed the Canadian focus tree, because there is stuff in there to do with like dealing with the Quebec conscription crisis, I believe. And so if you just release Quebec, I mean, that kind of solves the conscription crisis. As a very quick note, just before we move on to the next nation, I do want to bring up a line at the top that says, while these are a list of releasable nations, these are only the ones that I believe Jonathan has added. So it may be there are some other releasable nations that can occur, maybe through like the Brazil, Argentina, Chile focus tree that aren't necessarily the same. For example, the sort of Native American um, Chile tree with like the massive list of releasables. That's probably not going to be mentioned here. Next up, we've got the peninsula of the Yucatan. Honestly, I don't know too much about this place. They've got like um, temples in jungles, like pyramid temples. Um, the capital appears to be Cancun. No factories, eight manpower. I wish everybody the best of luck in their great endeavors with the Yucatan Peninsula. And maybe going on to a country with a slightly easier start, we have the Republic of Rio Grande which is a historical Mexican breakaway state. This time you do have some starting manpower and some factories. So I think this is a legitimate state where you could maybe go after Mexico, secure like a new Mexican state and then push into America. What the full extent you can do with that remains to be seen, of course. And finally, we have Easter Island, which they did mention in the Chile Dev Diary, but it seems that you can probably release them regardless at the start of the game, 1936, in which they actually have a unique leader, a guy called Juan, who has a really good starting spirit, like really good, and a really cool hat. For a man who's got cultural preserve and scholar 40% max factories in a state, my goodness. It says he's a preserver, but this guy feels like an oil man. He's got the look of like, he's gonna mine a ton of oil and he is shipping it out to the United States. I bid good luck to anybody who endeavors upon an Easter Island world conquest. Canada, Canada, Canada. While this DLC does seem to be about South America, it seems that Canada is going to be getting quite a lot of love in the next update. First things first, they're getting another production company towards railways, meaning you can produce trains cheaper, build supply hubs faster, and build railway hubs faster. This is really big because for anybody who perhaps is struggling with um, going after the United States as Canada, the biggest advice I can give you is build supply hubs all along the line against America because those guys don't have supply and you can. And with this focus, you can get an extra 15% towards building those supply hubs. Just build them all and beat them with supply. Carrying on, many of the Canadian country leaders also start with unique traits. So Mackenzie King is now a liberal corporatist, give you some research speed and ideology drift defense. It's pretty good. The infrastructure can be helpful. Nothing too crazy, but it's fine. J.S. Woodsmith is now a pioneer of the Canadian social gospel. Mobilization speed. My goodness, that army is just coming out to fight. But um, communism support and unaligned support. So a bit of a combative ability against your own growth. Make your mind up, J.S. Which one? Perhaps the scariest portrait in Hoi 4, Adrian, is now the Canadian Fuhrer. I mean... <laughs> And sometimes it speaks for itself, but political power gain plus 15%, war support, and some fash support. So that's just like a really good trait. That has to be the best one here. Sorry to uh, Tim Book, but the book ends with him being a veteran communist, giving him stability and factory output. Not necessarily the best buffs in the world. The factory output is nice. The stability is kind of weak, and it truly has nothing on the 15% political power gain that the old fear has got over there. Spooky. To anybody playing the Canadian democratic focus trees, whether you're going independent or staying with the UK, 
there are three new focuses for you to take, those being the Dominion of Canada Rifle Association, the Canadian Citizenship Act, and the Newfoundland Act. The Rifle Association focus will give you a national spirit towards infantry equipment production cost and some army experience gain. Generally, just an all-round good focus. I mean, you're practically always going to be building guns as Canada, so this is just straight up positive. I also note that this um, focus is available to, can I even say that word on YouTube? <laughs> the symbol clubs of the right wing path. This is interesting because there have been some players who feel that it's really difficult to get out enough units in time to actually take down the US before the US snowballs with like the War Power Act. As a result, maybe taking this focus will help you get the guns out, train the units faster, get your army XP up higher so you can actually get better units, and all in all help you with your conquest of America. Moving on down, we've got the Canadian Citizenship Act, giving you recruitable population factor, surrender limit, research speed, daily autonomy, progress, my goodness, just flat out positive buffs all across the board. Now this is available to both independent Canada and UK Canada, meaning this is another avenue to help you boost your independence. In addition, the recruitable population factor and research speed are going to be really useful in snowballing and getting ahead much further. What I'm really struggling with is the surrender limit. Who is invading Canada? Maybe the Japanese have got their eyes on you. I'm not quite sure, but hey, we'll take the surrender limit. Never look a gift horse in the mouth. And finally, we've got the Newfoundland Act, which will allow you to get Newfoundland and Labrador as a democratic Canada, again, whether you're independent or whether you're staying with the Allies. It seems the main thing you need to do is have an opinion of Britain over 51, so basically just improving relations. If all goes according to plan, you can send over the event, and hopefully they'll give you the two states back. But wait, there's more. I can't believe there's more. Canada's getting like a huge rework here. This isn't. This isn't necessarily like a small change here or there. This is like lots of things have been changed. Okay, so some of the old focuses have also been touched up. This is not all of them, so some of them we'll have to find in game. But the ones we're going to go over in the dev diary is now Crown Corporations is 35 days instead of 70. This is a really big deal, and I'm really glad that the devs have taken note of this because something I've talked about before is how between 1936 and 1939, there's oftentimes not as much going on. Very few wars, uh, very few things to do. You're basically just waiting on your next research and your next focus. So having shorter focuses, 35 days, is really good in that time period. However, after 1939, once kind of the big World War II has started, you're going to be busy microing front lines, dealing with air, um, dealing with navy, managing supply lines, you name it, you're going to be doing it. And then I really feel like the 70 day focuses are more appropriate because you don't have time like every month to pick a new focus and again and again and again. So really front loading focus trees with lots of shorter focuses, I think is a really positive way to go. And I'm very happy they're doing so. National Housing Act is getting a change in that now when you take it, if Mackenzie King is your leader, he's going to get father of the Canadian welfare state, giving him 10% stability and civilian factory construction speed. Ooh, okay. In addition to the buffs he already has towards research and infrastructure, this is better. I'm not sure if he's quite reached the Canadian Fury yet, but he's definitely doing a lot better with this. Of course, now there's a real emphasis for you to take this focus even earlier, because with the civilian factory construction speed buff, you can just snowball growth. Maritime Colonial Railway, instead of just giving you free railways, in addition, now gives you two civilian factories. So this is just a straight up buff to Canada, an additional two civs, you cannot complain, these guys are giga powerful. New leader traits, new civs, reworked focus trees, the ability to get Newfoundland and Labrador without going to war with Britain. Oh, and also a specific agency created for them, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Now that is some Canadian love if I have ever seen it. I'm sure some people will probably want to do another Canada playthrough now, considering all of these changes, which is kind of funny for a South America DLC. North America, South America, North America, America. Updated Central American Formable. Wait, Formable? Formable Nation? <gasps> They're getting even more love. It's literally Christmas. So to anybody who's playing in Central America, because we've done South America and we've done North America, I guess now we're doing Central America, the Formable Nation has the ability for you to incorporate Panama and incorporate the Republic of Yucatan. To briefly touch on this, the Incorporate Panama decision only requires you to own the country of Panama, 
but you get a call on the Panama Canal. This is of course a big deal because that is effectively a massively reduced war justification time against the United States, which means that if you're going to war with the United States, you're gonna be able to get the element of surprise on them much easier. I do promise at some point, we're gonna talk about Uruguay and Paraguay in this, in this dev diary, I do promise. But next up, we've got the United States of America getting a brand new industrial concern for Union Pacific Railroad. This is, um, I think, basically just the Canadian railway company that we saw from earlier, but this time it's got a American cover to it. Meanwhile, over in the war plan section of the American focus tree, taking different war plans will now actually unlock operatives that you can use relevant to those countries. So in the interest of war plan silver going after Italy, you can get Joe Sal Savoldi. That's not excluding, in addition, Johan um, and Fritz jo Goodness me, look at that hat. That is a good hat. Um, there have also been some new Japanese operatives added, including, oh my god, Ignatius Timothy Tribish Lincoln with a very, very trendy hat, and John Seema Farnsworth, who looks very fashionable, very dapper. I like his collar and his nice haircut. Okay, are you all still with me? Because no, we're still not gonna talk about Uruguay and Paraguay. So some of the traits towards the different leaders you can get, such as Karl Donitz, who I think is the German submarine officer, who I think he, he actually managed to get through till the end of the World War and survive the trials and everything, I believe. Regardless, when you're picking traits for these characters, they've had a rework, shifted them around, and tried to make different traits more desirable. The long and short of the changes is that some of the later traits were very difficult to get due to them requiring experience in that field in order for you to grow the prior traits, meaning that getting the later traits was far too difficult. In addition, some of the traits regarding mines, mine laying, mine sweeping, were effectively redundant because the scope of their utility was so like narrow it wasn't necessarily worth it to spec into them. To try and alleviate this, they've brought some of the harder to gain traits down and less blocked behind other traits, and they've also combined the mine traits into one single trait that they appear to have named Minecraft. Minecraft. <sighs> no further comment. No comment. So with Modred Viking covering the naval traits, we now move over to AVB, talking about Trial of Allegiance. Before they begin, they pre-note this by saying that there has been a large amount of bug fixes coming with the Bolivar patch that they're not going over here, but they will see in a later dev diary. So there's going to be a large patch coming soon. Okay, now we can talk about South America, <laughs> the namesake of the DLC, and it begins with an Amazon rework. So for anybody who has played in Brazil, um, particularly anyone who's tried to do the Portugal, Brazil, United Kingdom, um, sometimes you may end up fighting in the Amazon rainforest, which is very peculiar. This is of course a ridiculously dense, horrible place, a jungle filled with unnavigable foliage, and for World War II, like that's got a hundred years ago type of equipment, you're really just going to be massively struggling. So to try and recreate some of that gameplay, they've made it so the only navigable, uh, nav navigable, 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 I think that's how you said that, navigable paths is through the Amazon rainforest's rivers, navigable. As we can see here, the territory outside of the rivers is now impassable, so you won't be able to go through those regions, but the rivers themselves aren't necessarily one tile wide. They are in part two tiles wide, so either side of the river, meaning that there is opportunity for you to like do two front attacks instead of just one unit versus one unit attacking each other kind of in a stalemate. It seems here that they've tried to build a supply hub moving down the Amazon uh, River, which, you know, fair enough to them. If they're trying to go for Colombia or maybe Venezuela, that is possibly one of the better things you could do. I, for one, however, have always tried to stay away from this rainforest. And, you know, it's probably best to still stay away from it. I don't want my troops getting eaten by snakes. People of Argentina and players of Argentina alike, I have good news because for everybody who was disappointed that Juan Perón did not get his own dedicated focus tree, leader, uh, portrait, traits in general, they have actually gone back. This is, oh goodness me, is that Elida? Elida. Regardless, they have actually gone back 
and taken the time to create the ability for you to now elect Juan Perón as the leader of Argentina. This will be an alternate path inside of the historical branch, meaning you can either still go with the allies, um, sort of building up the South Americas against the Axis, or you can go down the old history path and go for South America, conquering everything, and I guess uniting South America under Perón. Looking at the focus here, we can see he gets non-aligned party, so he is a non-aligned character, which gives you political power gain 10%, stability, production efficiency cap, and division defense on core territory. So actually, pretty good. That's like what, B tier? Like a high B tier, I think? He also gets a very trendy portrait. And of course, all portraits must be judged on their hats. And his hat, well, that could be the best hat we've seen in this dev diary thus far. With that all being said, Argentina can now relax, for they do have their ability, and now we can move on to Paraguay and Uruguay. We start off by looking at Paraguay, which is in a pretty unfortunate state. Um, their starting national spirits include the aftermath of the Triple Alliance, which involves the Paraguayan War, or the War of the Triple Alliance, in which they lost against Brazil, Argentina and Uruguay, and actually lost 40% of their territory. So the country just got so much smaller, and the monthly population is still unable to bounce back after that defeat. Next up, we have the toll of the Checo War, Checo War perhaps, probably said terribly, which was fought between 32 and 35 against Bolivia over the Checo Boreal region. Um, this was like a very, I wanna say like deadly event, mass casualties from both sides. And as a result, there is just no enthusiasm to go into any more wars. Paraguay has taken too many L's, it's an unfortunate time. And so, if Germany is anything to go by, losing a couple of serious wars is probably going to thrust you into some sudden political shifts, and uh, Paraguay is no different. So in February 1936, Rafael Franco is going to launch a coup against the government. Whether you let him do so or try to resist him is what's going to dictate you going down the historical path or the ahistorical path. So going down the historical path will involve allowing Rafael Franco to do his coup. And while he may not be a communist, this will allow him to do some, let's say, left-leaning policies, such as allowing unions to strike or allowing female workers. Unfortunately for him, nothing quite lasts forever, and the military isn't going to look too kindly on him being there, meaning that as you move down the tree, you'll have a mutually exclusive choice, as we can see, between pull back troops from the Cheko or revenge for the Cheko war, in which you're going to need to decide whether you're going to get rid of him or keep him there. As it would happen, the military aren't necessarily too happy with Franco's position in government, and depending on his choices regarding troops on the Cheko region, the place that had that terrible war against Bolivia, will decide whether the military wants to oust you or not to oust you, opening up more alternative history options. If you decide to pull back troops from the region, the military is not going to take too kindly for that, especially after everything they've gone through, and oust you from the government. At that point, an extremely right-wing leaning government is going to take over in the form of a sort of military dictatorship. As we follow the focuses down, we can see that they'll involve suspending elections, banning the Liberal Party, and eventually the, oh goodness me, of the army. Yeah, these guys are pretty right-wing if this focus tree is anything to go by. As we move down to the next image, oh, Interestingly, the name of the focus has actually changed between images. Um, it was called something different in the previous image, and this one is called the movements within the army. Um, interesting. Regardless, it seems here that they are so um, intent on flipping over to Fash that you straight up unlock a decision to just flip your ideology instantly, with Gion Rojo becoming the ruling party. One should probably also not miss that in the bottom right, it clearly also states join the Axis. So uh, if you were hoping to join with Adolf, this is probably the path to go down. Alternatively, you don't necessarily have to, and you could go the way of, let's say, a form of economic appeasement, where if you accept American loans, they'll be able to give you money in exchange for you not joining factions, which is a kind of interesting mechanic. I really like the idea that there is now a way, or at least a mechanic that exists in the game, where you can stop other people joining factions to kind of control conflicts. It really makes me wish there was a way for this to be implemented with um, Hungary and Romania for the Axis and for Siam or Thailand for Japan to really like manage who is allowed to join whose faction by like bribing them, economic incentives, that kind of thing. 
But regardless, just as a mechanic on its own, I really like it. In a different world, however, maybe you didn't remove troops from the border. Maybe you are actually looking to get some revenge against Bolivia. And in doing so, you will unlock a series of war goals, allowing you to go after Bolivia, and eventually also for Peru and Chile to get yourself a coastline. What's interesting to me about this is, because those are the nations you take out first, it feels like it's kind of culminating in a revenge for the um, Paraguayan War against Argentina, Brazil and Uruguay that I mentioned earlier. Like those are kind of the free border nations that you're leaving to last because those are the ones you want to kind of fight as your final boss. And so finally to wrap up Paraguay, we would take a look at what happens if you didn't want Franco to do his coup in the February of 36 and instead resisted, which is going to result in a civil war. Paraguay being nicely divided by the Paraguay River there means you're probably going to have to hold out for as long as possible and the dev diary states that the enemy is actually going to be stronger than you at the start so you're going to have to hold out against that river line for help. As a result the majority of this section of the focus tree is basically involved trying to stabilize Paraguay under the administration prior to February 36. So this is going to involve reaching out to the Americas to ask them to help you because who wants um, communism in South America, right? That's something that America definitely doesn't want. So kind of get an early start on your own, like Operation Condor. With this, they'll send you resources that you can exploit to hopefully win your civil war. Once you've won your civil war, you'll be able to take the focus aftermath of the civil war, which I actually quite like just as a, as a mechanic here. So you get the national spirit devastation, which really cripples your country for 210 days. After that period, you get recovering economy, which isn't necessarily so bad, but then after that you get a flourishing economy. It's interesting to see on a small scale what the scope of some post-war content could look like that you could hypothetically apply to other nations. Um, the kind of the idea of war devastation from EU4, like certain provinces being just completely unusable after the conflict, this is of course not as powerful as that, but it certainly taps into this idea that once you've won a war, there should probably be some outstanding consequences. I'm reminded of the German Civil War, where after you've won, um, a few focuses down, there's like recovering from the Civil War and it gives you factory repair speed, but you've probably already repaired all of your factories before you've even taken the focus, so it kind of becomes a bit redundant. Unlike this, for example, where the debuff is pretty apparent, but there is a much further positive uh, buff for you to get by taking it. Can you believe we're not done yet? It's time to talk about Uruguay. So unlike Paraguay, the Uruguay focus tree actually follows a much more simpler formulaic process, which is pretty easy for us to go through. So the beginning begins with Terra's dictatorship, which has a series of focuses on GDP growth, stability, and basically just building up your country. This should mean you should be able to get Uruguay into a pretty good state before you have to move on and choose some different political ideologies. Here we can see three mutually exclusive paths that you'll have available. The central and right path are both democratic, but with different leaders who both had different things that they tried to achieve, but ultimately end up with you joining the allies in both circumstances. However, if you want to go down a slightly different plan, uh, you can pick the left focus, which will eventually go down to the Furman plan, in which you can try to become Fash and go after the entirety of South America. In terms of military and industry, there are some shared branches to go over. I think I can see four key ones here. The first one they talk about is beneath the shadow of the Triple Alliance, that being of course the conflict that was <laughs> massively damaging to Paraguay, which will allow you to get uh, war goals against both Brazil and Argentina to take the states, Formosa and Punta Poro, and if you hold them for a year, you get to keep them and white piece them out. So this is the mechanic that we saw with Finland when they are able to hold Leningrad and piece out the Soviets. The Dev Diary goes on to say Uruguay also has access to this section. Um, interesting, because they were of course on the side of Brazil and Argentina in this war, but in their version, they're going after Rio Grande do Sul and the region of Mesopotamia. So they're kind of going after for their own personal gains as opposed to some kind of outland uh, like revenge for the previous conflict. Whether you do so as Paraguay or whether you do so as Uruguay, the hope most likely is going to be the same, and that is going after some major conflict and getting some massive cause. 
The examples being the South American Free States, this is the Paraguay version of the United South America, and the River Plate Federation, this of course being the Uruguay version of the United South America. Obviously, giant nations, a uh, massive end goal for both nations with relatively small focus trees, so it does feel like when you play these nations, that's kind of the end goal you're really hoping for. That covering the military, we quickly move over to the industry section, and in this they've got Laces Fair, which unlocks kind of a timed event decision, or a mission, I guess that is what it's called, in which every 270 days, the landowners in your country are going to do something at random, build a sieve, build a mill, build a dockyard, um, add a building slot, you don't get to decide it, it just happens. I think this is like in Victoria, like Victoria Free, where the landowners will just build buildings in your country, you know, independent of whatever you want to build. This is that, which is super interesting. It's like, it's so, so odd that a um, kind of Victoria mechanic is moving over. There doesn't necessarily seem a way for you to influence the outcome of what you're getting, but if you can like stack it so that you get um, building slots and sieves, that would be super powerful, uh, but I wouldn't get my hopes up. Over in this tree, we can see predominantly research slots, with each subsequent tier of research slot that you're unlocking being harder to get than the less, uh, last one because it requires industry. I think a similar example to this would be like the China tree, um, in the Chinese industrial tree, if you want to get a couple more research slots, you have to take the first one, and then the one below it requires an amount of uh, factories. There also seems to be some kind of investment mechanic at play, where the more you have specced into different types of industries within your country, as we kind of saw earlier with the investment schemes, there's agriculture, beef, wool, and cash crops. For each of them that you've done, you get one sieve once you take the focus for doing so. This reminds me of France, how if you build up these separate sections with infrastructure and building slots, once you move down the, the industry tree, then you get the sieves for doing so. I feel like this is kind of akin to that. Four sieves is quite a lot for these very small nations. And with that, we have effectively come to the end. There is some other things I could talk about, um, such as how the focus trees both have the shared military branch that we saw with Brazil, Argentina and Chile, but it's practically going to be the same branch as shown previously, so I won't bore you with looking at that again. Wow, that was so much, so, so much coming in this next DLC, when it's not necessarily even a major DLC. I guess what I really like about it is, the players coming back, it's not just people who are like, oh, I'm gonna see Brazil, then leave, or I'm gonna see Argentina, then leave. There are reasons for you to now replay Canada, replay Peru, replay USA, replay whatever you want, like there's just more options available all across the board and generally the flavour of the region in its entirety seems to have seen some really good growth. All in all, really good dev diary, very good stuff, I'm really shocked that I got name dropped for some reason, I mean it's funny, I, I think it's funny and I'm very grateful. So thank you very much for watching, next week it's going to be Alt History Brazil, I think we've only got like two weeks left until the actual DLC releases, it's pretty soon, so not too much left. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked, feel free to like, feel free to subscribe, well, and I'll see you all next time. Ah, oh, I need to go have a rest. Bye!